Among the many creation myths around the world, the book of Genesis imagined a designer god who fashioned the world and life in just six days. Finally, in the 19th century, science pieced together what had really happened. Charles Darwin hit upon a truly brilliant idea that elegantly explains all of life on Earth without any need to invoke the supernatural or the divine. Here's a helpful way to look at the problem Darwin faced. Climbing a mountain. Let's call it Mount Improbable. Let's say at the bottom we have the simple bacterial beginnings of life on Earth. At the top, man today, or any complicated piece of biology. But how did we get to the top? If it had happened by blind chance, or by design, it would be equivalent to leaping up a sheer cliff in a single bound. Come round the other side of Mount Improbable, we find something very different. Here there's no sudden precipitous cliff. Here there's a gentle slope, a gradient of evolution. All we have to do is put one foot in front of the other, and we'll get to the top. Darwin's great insight was that life evolved steadily and slowly, inching its way gradually over four billion years. Natural selection, not a divine designer, was the sculptor of life. So evolution, driven by Darwin's motor of natural selection, gets us to the top of Mount Improbable, from primeval simplicity to ultimate complexity. The design hypothesis couldn't even begin to do that because it raises an even bigger problem than it solves. Who made the designer? The abundance and variety of life on Earth may seem improbable, but it's self-evidently futile to invent an improbable God to explain that very improbability. I thought that in my lifetime evolution would be accepted and taught around the world as a scientific fact, supported by overwhelming evidence. But unfortunately, the whole point about faith is that even massive and constantly accumulating physical evidence cuts no ice. Evolution today is under threat. In the Bible Belt of Middle America, evangelical Christians are fighting back against science. In the New World, religion is free enterprise. Rival groups set up shop on every street corner competing to save people's souls and collect their money. Fundamentalist Christianity is on the rise among the electorate of the world's only superpower, right up to and including the president. If you believe the surveys, 45% of Americans, that's about 135 million people, believe the universe is less than 10,000 years old. This is the New Life Church in Colorado Springs, where conservative Christians have built an $18 million worship center as their New Jerusalem in the foothills of the Rocky Mountains. Evangelical churches like this have become a powerful lobby, exerting enormous influence on everything in America, from the teaching of science in schools to foreign policy. This place strains belief. It isn't just a church, but a ready-made social network. The 12,000-strong congregation can also attend 1,300 organized programs where they can meet to exchange Christian tips on everything from marriage to dog walking. It's all terribly exuberant and intense. Much less tradition here than in Lord, but plenty of swaggering authority. The pastor is Ted Haggard, a powerful man, chairman of the National Association of Evangelicals, and the new life is Ted's Evangelical Vatican. Sadly, the warmth of the welcome would prove short-lived when I started talking to Pastor Haggard about the Bible and scientific fact. You'll find yourself wrong on some things, right on some other things. But please, in the process of it, don't be arrogant. The New Life Church in Colorado Springs is a bastion of American religious conservatism. Thank you for transforming our lives. Thank you, Lord God. I've come to try to understand why what I see as irrational faith is thriving and why it's attacking science. 
Pastor Ted Haggard has a hot line to God and to George Bush. A staunch Republican, he claims he has a weekly conference call with the President and has also rubbed shoulders with Tony Blair and Ariel Sharon. Well, that was really quite a show you gave us uh, today. A fair bit of money seems to have been spent here. Yes. I wanted pe people to be able to worship and enjoy it and then be in a setting where the speaker is close to them. That's why it's in the round. And so they can be up close to me, and so I can look at them. Well, it's certainly very effective what you do. I mean, it seemed to me to have all the, the arts of... I mean, I was almost reminded, if you'll forgive me, because of Nuremberg Rally. I mean, uh, such incredibly... Well, I Dr. Know. Goebbels would have been proud. I don't know anything about the Nuremberg Rallies, but I know lots of Americans think of it as a rock concert. When I prepare a presentation, I don't prepare it to get a group of lunatics to come in and just say, oh yes, Pastor Ted, you're just so wonderful. I believe everything you say. I would be opposed to that. person needs, at the center, some sense of meaning about existence. It is life and death to us. It makes us who we are. Yet most of us, as we grow up and become responsible adults, accept that life is complex, that we live in a world of subtle shades, not sharp black and white. I worry that these born-agains are being persuaded to return to childish certainties. The only truth they need is God. God as interpreted for them by their pastor. Knows that we believe the Bible is the word of God. And today I talked about love your neighbor as yourself. Now I didn't have to produce evidence, sociological evidence or psychological evidence. The book is true. How can you say that not speak for themselves and they're told everything in this book is true? Because they don't have to believe that. The evidence yeah. I presented is when we read this book, it says one thing, that book says another, yeah. that book says another, that book... Well, the evidence I can present is we've got a book written over 1,500 years by 40 different authors on one subject, and it doesn't contradict itself. Well, you, it can't, you can't give me two, two experts in certain areas that are in the same generation, in the same area of study, that don't contradict themselves. That's the beauty of science. We have, we have lots of evidence, and the evidence is all the time coming in, mm -hmm. constantly changing our, our minds. Right. And uh, whereas you have one book, which you say right. doesn't change, exactly. it's not getting people to think for themselves. And we've all decided as a group to go into the holy place, true or false? True. True. Everybody say true. true. All right, then. That's the vote. But my biggest concern is that evangelicals like Haggard are foisting evident falsehoods on their flock. Evangelicals are denying scientific evidence just to support Bronze Age myths. We fully embrace the scientific method as American evangelicals. And we think as time goes along, as we discover more and more facts, that we'll learn more and more about how God created the heavens and the earth. The scientific method clearly demonstrates that the world is four and a half billion years old. Do you accept that? Yeah, you know what you're doing is you are, you are accepting some of the views that are accepted in some portions of the scientific community as fact. Where in, where in fact, your grandchildren might listen to the tape of you saying that and laugh at you. You want to bet? Sometimes it's hard for a human being to study the ear or study the eye and think that happened by accident. I beg your pardon, did you say by accident? Yeah. What do you mean by accident? That the eye just formed itself somehow. And who says it did? Well, some evolutionists say it. Not a single one that I've ever met. Really? Really. Oh. You obviously know nothing about the subject of evolution. Or maybe you haven't met the people I have. <laughs> but you see, you, you do understand. You do understand that this issue right here of intellectual arrogance is the reason why people like you have a difficult problem with people of faith. I don't communicate an error of superiority over the people because I know so much more. And if you only read the books I know, and if you only knew the scientists I knew, then you would be great like me. Well, sir. There could be many things that you know well. There are other things that you don't know well. As you age, you'll find yourself wrong on some things, right on some other things. But please, in the process of it, don't be arrogant. A rather disconcerting experience. We were just packing up our stuff ready to go, and he suddenly drove up in his pickup truck and said, get off my land immediately, I'll have you thrown in jail, I'll have seize your film. And he then said a very curious thing. He said, you call my children animals. 